Good morning. Um, my name is Rich. I am an ordinand here at St. Paul Shadwell. I'm married to Louisa, and we have a little boy called Johannes, which is very exciting. We're going to have another little boy or girl, um, we don't know, in March, uh, so that's really exciting too, so praise God for that. Um, we are, as Ed said, working our way through a series called The Irresistible Jesus. We're looking at who Jesus is, at all kinds of things about him. Find the name of this topic, the irresistible Jesus, quite intriguing. If you think about Jesus, of course we want to say that he's irresistible. We can't resist him. And yet, in my own life, I'm aware of a different reality, that there are moments where actually I do resist him. And I think just as we start this series today, it's worth bearing that in mind, that when we see Jesus in all his glory, when we read the scriptures, when we meet him in worship, when we're lost in wonder, love and awe, and we stand before him, then of course we find Jesus to be irresistible. But then there are those moments as well where we have been up all day and it's late and we're tired. And it becomes more difficult to find Jesus irresistible. We find ourselves drawn to a, another way of living. We, you know, those things that, that, those kind of things that lurk beneath us, raise their heads. You know, anger, lust, sin, those sort of things that the monsters that hide behind the covers that come out at night. And so it's just worth bearing that in mind. But Jesus is, of course, irresistible. And my hope, as we look at this passage today, is that we again will be reminded of just how irresistible he is. Rod spoke last week about the king coming, and he said that when Jesus comes in Mark's gospel, he announces three things, a new exodus, a new creation, and a new kingdom. And what I love about Mark's gospel, he's, he really doesn't waste any time. He's, not, he's, kind of, he's only got a short period of time. It's like he doesn't want to really waste your time by telling you all kinds of distance. So he's in a hurry through the gospel. He really wants to get you to the basics of the faith. This is what we believe as Christians, he's saying. And so he starts by saying, Christ is king. Christ has come with this new kingdom. Something new is happening. Jesus enters Galilee. We read in, Matthew, in Mark 1. Jesus enters Galilee and he steps into this world and he declares... The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God has come. It's one of the things we're going to think about today as we look at healing. What does it mean to believe in the kingdom of God and to believe in healing? What does it mean to believe those things now in this world that we live in? Now, I have to confess, I've preached on this. This is the third time that I've preached on this passage in a year and a half. That's always challenging, especially if you've already used one of your sermons with a congregation once. But um, it's also exciting because it means that we can look at something in a different way. And today, we're not going to focus too much on the fascinating characters, although they are fascinating, the characters in this passage. But we're going to look intentionally just at Jesus in a, in a different kind of way. We're going to ask, what does it mean to come to Jesus as King who heals? So I'll pray for us, and then we'll get into this. Father, we come before you as your children. We love you. We thank you for your word. We pray as we, meet, as we read the word, we'd meet you there, that our hearts would be like Wesley's heart, strangely warmed. Spirit, we pray that you'd be in this moment that we, we would see you and hear you speak to us, that we would be challenged and encouraged, that we'd leave this place knowing more of our salvation and of who you are. And we pray all these things in the name of the resurrected Jesus. Amen. So the kingdom of God is near. Jesus steps out into Galilee Amongst these people who've been waiting for a saviour. These people who've been in exile. Who've heard rumours that God might one day come. Who've had many false starts. And Jesus steps into Galilee with this radical message. Politically, socially, 
theologically, it's radical. The kingdom of God is near. Repent, turn around, and believe the good news. I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I, I kind of wonder whether there were some people in Galilee who were saying to themselves, here? I mean, think about it. Jesus steps into Galilee, into the ordinary, the mundane, amongst people who have jobs and families and problems and sicknesses and joys. And he says this radical thing, the kingdom of God is near. My initial response, I think, if I was in Galilee, would be near here, now. I mean, is the kingdom of God near? And Jesus comes and his message into this ordinary and mundane is accompanied by acts of power and authority. I mean, that's how we know, actually, that it really is near. Because Jesus again and again seems to be doing things that are accompanied with power and authority. That's one of the things they say about him. He's acting with power and authority. He's acting like a king would. In the ordinary, in the mundane, he's acting like a king. And he's asking a question. Who rules? He's saying to the world around him, who's the king of this place? Who's in charge? Let me ask you the same question. Who rules? Who's in charge? Who's the king in your life now? Do you know, one of the things about having children is that I think you learn a lot about your own spirituality through children, which is slightly, you know, is, I guess, humbling in one sense. But we've got Johannes, and he's 16 months now. And he's beginning to start asserting his own authority and power. You know, he's, for ages, he was just a baby. You could walk around in your arms, and, and, you know, he was quite easy to control. But then he started to do things like make more noise, and then he started to crawl, and then he started to decide what he wanted to eat and what he didn't want to eat. And then he started to walk, and then he started to climb on top of things like his high chair and stand on top of his high chair with his hands like this, like, I'm the king. And the interesting thing for a parent is, is that you have to stop that. And he doesn't really understand why you want to stop him from you know, falling off something at times and half his height. You know, he doesn't understand that. He wants to assert his own power and authority. I want to stand on my high chair with my hands in the air. I also want to dance there. Not me. I mean, I might want to. But, but Johannes wants to and does. And when we stop him, you know, one of the questions he's asking, although I'm sure he's not able to articulate in this way, is who's in charge here? We learn a lot about our own spirituality that way. You know, who's in charge It's one of the questions we're asking all the time, the way we live our lives. Who rules your life? In our passage today, that's really what's happening. There's a clash of two kingdoms. On the one hand is Jesus. He started to move with this authority, with this power. He started to bring healing and forgiveness and freedom In covenant, he's taken, God has come as a person, taken on our humanity, stepped into our world as a king. And then he starts to engage with the realities of this world, with the the dirt of this world. Had it not been raining, I was going to bring a whole tub of dirt with me and just to demonstrate. That's what God does. He gets involved in the dirt of our lives. And this passage demonstrates the clash of two kingdoms. On the one hand, you have Jesus, the king. And on the other hand, you have the rule, the things that have been happening to humanity. One, uh, my former pastor wrote this. Sickness which is what we find a lot of in this passage, in the paradise man, but also the sickness of the heart. Sickness like sin and all other kinds of suffering are the sign of the rulership of the devil. Sickness is one of the main instruments for control of humanity. When Jesus heals the sick, he's forcing back the frontier of the kingdom of darkness and extending the kingdom of light. What we have in this passage is that clashing moment. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. 
the rule of God and the rulership of the devil over humanity. And we meet that living out in these people. First of all, in the paralyzed man. He, has be, he is brought through the roof. He's brought through the roof. He's dropped down by his friends. And this encounter with Jesus carries on before us. It's interesting, isn't it, that the paralyzed man's obvious need is to be healed. And yet Jesus' first words to him are this. I forgive your sins. Timothy Keller says that the reason that happens is this. Jesus is, beginning, is, is saying the heart of the matter is really the heart. What's really going on here is that the, the sickness you feel, the, the paralysis he experiences, is the consequences of sin in our world. But sin is the real issue. And what is sin? Sin is when we choose to rule ourselves. Sin is when we choose to not let God be in charge. That's what happens in the Garden of Eden. There's a question in the Garden of Eden. The question is this, who rules? And that's what's happening here. Who rules? So what Jesus does is he forgives his sin. And of course, the Pharisees who we'll come back to they question by what authority he has to do that. See, what's lying at the heart here is this collision. Who rules? By what authority, Jesus, do you act? Who gave you the power to forgive sins? Then we have the tax collector. And the tax collector has sided with the ruling authorities of his day. He is one of those people who collaborates with the authorities. No, nobody likes him. For me, he's the guy, I don't know if you've seen Band of Brothers, but he's one of the people who sides with the Germans. And if you've ever seen Band of Brothers, this amazing scene where Holland is freed. And the people of Holland take the people who side with the Germans and they basically, they beat them. They humiliate them. And I think that's probably what they'd like to do to this tax collector. I mean, he's siding with the people who's, who are oppressing them. What Jesus does is this. He offers him another way to live. Another kingdom to live in. He says, you don't have to be ruled anymore by the powers of this world. But you can be ruled by Jesus, by the king, by God himself. Who rules you? Who's the king? Of course, the power and authority of the world is best summed up, unfortunately for the Pharisees, in the Pharisees' questioning. Because the Pharisees' questions are this. Who are you, Jesus, to do these things? Who are you, Jesus, to forgive sin? You don't have the right to forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. Of course, Jesus is God. But you see, the Pharisees are the one, that question. They're the question that says, Jesus isn't really king. You can't really trust him. That's what their question is. When they oppose Jesus, that's what they're opposing. His right to rule over us. His right to be in charge. See, all three of our characters in the story are bound. And what Jesus is offering them is a chance to live differently. The paralyzed man is forgiven and healed. Healing is a consequence of, of forgiveness. It's one of the things that Jesus brings to the world, that God brings to the world. It's not the norm at the moment, but it will be one day. Healing is the sign of his kingdom. The forgiveness and inclusion of the tax collector is the sign of his kingdom. And the Pharisaic desire to do things their own way, to rule over themselves, is, in fact, the sign of what humanity does over and over again. And it's not just humanity. A few years ago, Louise and I adopted a dog. Now, um, we were going through that phase, you know, I think lots of, if you, this may not be able to be proved sociologically, but I'll try anyway. Um, I reckon couples do this. They get married, 
Some couples don't do this, they just get married and have children. But some couples, like Louise and I, we got married, and we started thinking, well, you know, we had this natural desire to nurture something. So we bought a plant from Ikea. And we bought a nice tree. That, you know, they're not, not very expensive. One of those trees that's really easy, that doesn't need water in. And we proved that it didn't need water in. It survived for years without water. Doesn't need sunlight. Doesn't really need you to even acknowledge it's there. And, and, we, and we had it kind of in my mind. I thought, if we can keep this alive for a year and a half, we'll get an animal. So we, we kept this tree alive for more than a year and a half. And we may have replaced it at one point, but a tree alive in our lives. And so we decided to adopt a dog. I'm not sure why we decided to adopt a dog. We wanted to get a dog, and we thought, we'll adopt a dog, it's the right thing to do. So we went to the RSPCA dog kennel place, and then we're walking through. And, and to be honest, it's a mixture of the RSPCA of snarling dogs, and then dogs that are like ridiculously big, so you, you can possibly have one in your house. And you walk up and down looking for a dog. It's, it's kind of a strange experience, but you walk and you're kind of thinking, not that dog, not that dog. Not that dog, that dog's too big. And then we came across this one dog, and he had his paw on the side of the fence. He'd clearly learned how you get adopted. And so he, <laughs> he, he kind of had his paw, and, and as we stopped by, he kind of like edged his nose through the cage, and, and, and he, he started to win us over, and we took him out and started to bond, and he was good, he could fetch stuff, and he could all do all kinds of things, and he was, I think he was seven years old at the time, and so we didn't know his background, but we, we adopted him, we fixed our house, so we got him home, and he was fine, and is fine, whenever he's with people, but what we've discovered is that when people aren't there, he's not fine, in fact, he's crazy when people aren't there. So when he's with people, he's like laying on your lap and he'll lay by the fire and he'll, you know, he's the perfect dog. But as soon as you leave the room, he goes mad. Well, things have been, you know, we moved, we had a baby, we moved to London, we decided to give my dog to my parents, we moved, we graduated at the dog stage. And so um, we left him with my parents. Now, his, his behaviors got progressively worse. And um, my parents were down here recently, they went home. And I got a phone call the next day from my parents saying, the dog has destroyed the house. And now, he, he was, he's kind of been destroying houses for a while, so, so we were surprised that he'd destroyed it even more. But I've seen the evidence, and he had destroyed the house, ripped stuff out, scratched the table, all kinds of things. So finally, I convinced my parents to call the RSPCA and ask them for help. So the guy at the RSPCA said, well, the thing is, this dog spent the first seven years of its life outside. It's an outside dog. And whenever you have him inside, he thinks he's an inside dog because you're there and you're his owner. You rule over him. You, you're the master. And so whenever you're with him inside, he thinks he's an inside dog. And so he lays down and acts like an inside dog would. But as soon as you go out of sight, the voice in his head starts to say, you belong outside. You're an outside dog. And so his immediate reaction is, I'm an outside dog. I've got to get outside as soon as possible. And so we have had many phone calls, because my parents haven't changed the phone number on his dog tag. I've had many phone calls while I've been down here from people who found my dog in the middle of a road or in the middle of a field or doing something in the countryside. And what we have learned is that He's an outside dog. You see, we have been invited into the kingdom of God. And he rules over us. And when we see him, we find his rule irresistible. The problem is that so often we don't see him. We don't, we, you know, life gets on top of us, situations get on top of us, people get, you know, under our skin. And the voice starts to whisper, you're an outside dog. You don't belong here. What are you doing here? You're not ruled by them. You're not ruled by Jesus. You're ruled by me. Who rules over you? Who's your master? Who has authority in your life? Where do you find comfort, healing, forgiveness, encouragement? Because he's the king. Jesus is the king. And you know, our story today 
What happens in our story is actually a, a mirror in some ways of what happens to Jesus on the cross. It's what happens to Jesus throughout the gospel. That's what I love about Mark. He's continually saying, look, it's the cross, people. It's the cross, people. It's the cross. You see, in our story, Jesus heals and forgives. And you know, the thing that Jesus does is he heals and forgives and brings freedom. He preaches this radical message. And it leads him to being accused of all kinds of things, of treason, of blasphemy, of blasphemy. You see, what happens in our story is, is Jesus heals and forgives and he's accused. What happens on the cross is Jesus heals. He's been healing and he's been forgiving and he's been setting people free and he's been bringing about this new kingdom and he's accused. And on the cross, he's crucified. They take him and they beat him. They whip him. They turn against him. In that moment, the devil, the kingdom of darkness, pushes back against the kingdom of light. And Christ is crucified. But do you know, the hope, the good news, the thing we cling to for our healing, is that just like in our story, the cross leads to new life. It leads to resurrection. The king has come. And the king for us has not just come, but the king has died and has been resurrected and he's coming again. It's good news. It's good news for us. We're people of the kingdom of God. We stand in this moment between the resurrection and the second coming. We hope in the healing of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't feel like it's close to us. Sometimes we resist it, but my encouragement is this. There's a king. The thing all humanity has been waiting for, the things all our stories are about, has happened. Jesus has come. And we look to him because he has power and authority, because God chose to take the covenant that he made with us seriously. And so he entered her earth as, human, as a human, died in our place, took our place on the cross, was crucified, was the crucified Lamb of God. So taking our sin, but not only taking our sin, in kingdom, power, and authority, he overcomes it. The cross is both covenant and kingdom. It's taking our place and it's overcoming our problems. What does this mean for us? What does it mean for us? Well, first of all, to follow the way Jesus deals with things, it means forgiveness of sin. The healing of the heart. Because the heart of the matter is the heart. The thing that matters most is that we're healed. Our sins are forgiven. The broken world that we live in will not be broken forever. You know, I've, um, recent, I've been seeing a, a counsellor, and I, I see uh, occasionally sporadically, and it's great. I'm an extrovert, so it means I get 50 minutes of being able to talk at someone who's paid to stay there and listen. Sounds like a great deal to me. And so I um, was telling her a story, and I'd gone with the intention of making myself, i basically gone with the intention of making myself sound quite righteous, and, and these people quite bad. And she just reflected back some stuff to me. And by the end of it, my realisation was this, I'm still in need of a healer. I'm still in need of a healer. I've been healed, but I need to be healed. I've been saved, but I need a savior. So first of all, for us, it means this. We live under his reign. We live in his kingdom. And we keep coming back to him and saying, I want your authority in my life. I want your power in my life. I want to know who I am in you. And from the place of knowing him, we obey him. And as we obey him from the place of knowing him, then we see the power and authority of Christ in our lives. And for the real issue of healing, for those of us who are sick, we keep on praying. We never stop praying for the healing of people. We never stop praying. And we recognize that when sickness comes, 
That's the move of the kingdom of darkness. We don't blame the people who are sick. We pray for them. We pray for them. We stand with them. Again and again and again, we stand next to them and we say, we will pray for you. Because we want to see the kingdom of light come. The same pastor who I quoted earlier said this, in our prayer for kingdom healing, we are either a sign of what will be, a sign of what will be, those of us who are healed, or a soldier in the king's army. Even though we may never be healed, we never surrender to sickness or yield to the one who seeks to use it as a weapon against us. And if we should die sick, we will die to the applause of our comrades in arms and will receive a hero's welcome in heaven. We never yield to sickness. We pray and we pray and we pray. Because it's the kingdom of God. It's a sign of the kingdom of God when healing comes. But if we should die sick, if those we love should die sick, we stand in the confidence that of two things. One, that they receive a hero's welcome as fallen brothers and sisters. And that we will see their healing because the king has risen. The kingdom will come. That's our hope. It's what we're longing for. And so I leave you with those two things. First of all, who rules over you? Are you experiencing his forgiveness? Are you bringing your life to him? And for those of us who are sick, who know people who are sick, for those of us who have suffered, have suffered, are suffering, I leave you with this hope The king will come again. And in the meantime, we just pray in his reign over and over again. I'm going to ask Ed to come in a moment, but I'd love to read these words from Isaiah 53. Shall we stand, Ed? Yeah, why don't we stand? Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you. We don't want to live like an outside dog. We want to live in the king in the king's house. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are sick. And pray for their healing. Father, I pray we'd know your forgiveness, that you gave us your son and said, look at him. And as we look at him, we see that he heals and he forgives and he sets free. Isaiah 53 says this, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. 
By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering of sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and will divide the spoils of the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Father, we give you praise. Jesus, we thank you. And Spirit, we invite you in. And by his wounds, we are healed.